Welcome back. This is part two of the Apes Chapter 17 lecture. Uh, we left off looking at how we should do things versus how we do things. Um, one of the the big point of emphasis, uh, again, I know I said this several times in the last lecture, um, but the big point of emphasis is just reduce and reuse. Um, so there are, are some examples of places that have encouraged uh, reusables. Um, you see Denmark, Finland, and part of Canada uh, have banned all beverage containers that can't be reused. So uh, in Finland, 95% of all soft drink, beer, wine, and spirits containers are refillable. So uh, you don't buy your 30-pack of Mountain Dew, drink them, recycle them. You take them back and you refill them. Uh, you see there are other uh, Denmark, again, Ireland, Taiwan, and the Netherlands have uh, really highly taxed single-use plastic uh, shopping bags like uh, Kroger sacks and things like that. Uh, in 2014, California banned the use of those uh, shopping bags statewide, so that's a that's a great thing. Um, there, there's a, a little bit of support of that spreading uh, throughout the U.S., but um, you know, as individuals, we can choose. To bring fabric bags, I know I, I do that as best I can, but I often forget. Um, I don't know how many of those fabric bags and canvas bags and things like that I have, just gathering up dust in my laundry room at home. Because if I forget them, I just buy buy more, um, and that's that's not a that's not a, a sustainable model. It's not something that I will be able to do forever. It's not something that anyone will be able to do forever. Um, there is a lot of potential in terms of recycling. Um, we can recycle household materials, workplace materials. That, that's where this becomes really, um, really powerful is when industries and um, workplaces recycle their stuff. Um, so if you grow up and you become a business owner, remember this stuff. Remember the impact that you can have uh, on every user of whatever your material is. You can help the process significantly by recycling upstream of the end user. Um, they're uh, looking at the life cycle of new items. There are a couple of different types of recycling. Uh, primary or closed loop recycling is where it gets recycled into the same thing. So aluminum cans become new aluminum cans, tires become tires, newspapers become newspapers, etc. Uh, secondary recycling is where you take waste materials from one thing and you recycle it and make it into something else. Uh, paper tends to be that way. Um, there are three steps to any recycling system. Collect it, convert it, sell it. Pretty straightforward there. Um, moving on to composting. Um, it's a, a different type of recycling. Uh, it's where you use bacteria to break down organic matter. Um, I do this at, at my house with my yard clippings and with my chicken waste. Um, they, they use like uh, wood shavings for, for bedding and, and I compost those. All of our food scraps, uh, basically anything that's biodegradable gets thrown into the compost bin and uh, we use it as fertilizer in our garden. Uh, really powerful in terms of, of improving uh, our landfill structure because we're removing that organic matter and organic matter is what's going to break down uh, once it gets buried into methane. So if we can remove those methane sources from our uh, from our landfills then we've, we've taken a huge step. <clears throat> uh, it does enrich the nutrients in the soil, reduces crop erosion, or reduces erosion, I'm sorry, improves yield. It's, it's a great natural fertilizer. Um, in Canada and European Union countries, uh, a lot of cities collect and compost 85% or more of their biodegradable waste in centralized facilities. Um, in Europe, you'll see different trash cans, uh, kind of like we have here, uh, where we've got trash recycling. But then there's a third one in Europe that's for compost, for anything that's biodegradable. So you throw your apple core in a different trash can than you throw your, your aluminum cans and, and all those types of things. So that helps. Uh, pros and cons of recycling. Um, there, there are costs. You know, it's it's not easy. Um, it's not cheap. Uh, so really, the only things that make economic sense are listed right here. There are other types of things we could recycle. They're just too expensive. Um, some cities profit by recycling with single pickup systems. So that's like uh, 
the way that it worked when I lived in, in Lebanon, single stream recycling. So I have a big trash can that I dump all my recycling in, and they take it and uh, run it through a single stream system, which we've talked about. Um, my my small town that I live near now does a similar thing, but they don't pick it up. I have to go and throw it into a big dumpster. Same kind of idea. They just don't pick it up at my house. I like that a little bit better because it reduces the carbon footprint. We don't have a, a truck driving house to house. We have one truck that goes to one place, empties the, the, the dumpster, brings a new dumpster, so on. Uh, Pay-as-you-throw approach would be like you pay by the bag or something along those lines. Um, and then... These types of things, the, you know, if you have a recycling center, you have to pay people to staff that recycling center. You have to pay people to do these things. So it does create jobs and, and help supplement the economy. So how should we deal with hazardous wastes? Well, we got we to gotta take special precautions depending on what the hazardous waste is. Like I've said a thousand times, the best way to deal with it is to prevent it. If we have existing waste, we should reuse it if at all possible, which is tricky often with hazardous waste. We can recycle it, which again is tricky with uh, hazardous waste. Often, though, we can neutralize it or we can make it less hazardous, and then we can store uh, whatever the whatever it's converted to more safely. Uh, we can use integrated waste management. Again, do a little bit of everything and don't do a lot of anything. Produce less, that would be great. Convert as much of it as possible to something less hazardous. Neutralize it as best we can. And then put the rest in long-term safe storage. Um, yeah, and, and like I said on that last slide, if we can substitute and, and remove those hazardous materials, if we can find something other than BPA to bend our plastics, we should. If we can find something other than coltan to put in our uh, cell phones, we should. This kind of talks about the whole uh, the whole process of, of integrated hazardous waste management. Not significantly different from integrated waste management. It's just that we have uh, the hazards um, and we need to, to neutralize those before we take the next couple of steps. There are some of the examples. You can do biological treatment. You can treat it with a chemical. Uh, think of like an acid-base reaction to, to produce water, something along those lines. Uh, we can do natural decomp. Uh, lots of different things, depending on what the hazardous waste is. Getting back to e-waste, most e-waste recycling uh, can create health hazards. More than 70% of the world's e-waste ends up in China somewhere. Uh, and there are not a lot of great regulations in terms of um, e-waste and how those metals have to be disposed of in China. So people work in dangerous conditions. There are some really rough news pieces that show... Um, kids and teenagers and adults and old people, people of all ages working in these crazy conditions where they're taking a hammer and busting apart computers and pulling out pieces that are valuable and then melting down other things. And it's just, it's just a, a mess of a system. So if we better regulated conditions domestically, which we, we do, they're better regulated here than they are in China, um, but it's more expensive. We could recycle them better, but we'd have to pay to do that. It's cheaper to export it to China and let them work in dangerous conditions for low wages. And, and so that's what we do. Um, so some of the more specifics to hazardous waste, I feel like that, that e-waste maybe got moved. That, that slide was kind of stuck in a weird place. Uh, but... Here are some physical methods, some chemical methods, and then the bioremediation types of stuff uh, that we can do uh, to negate hazardous waste. Uh, charcoal and resin filters, uh, distill liquid waste for sure, like uh, boil off waters and things like that. Encapsulate and store deadly waste safely and securely. Um, bury it in, in a lead chamber or something along those lines. Um, so yeah, I think that probably makes sense. Uh, a couple of other things. Uh, phytoremediation. Um, that's going to be using engineered plants, uh, so like uh, GM plants, to absorb, filter, remove contaminants from soil or water. Uh, sort of like what we looked at uh, wastewater treatment, how you can filter uh, wastewater with plants. Trying to take advantage of the things that plants do really well um, to purify water and, and things along those lines. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to do that. Uh, we can also uh, do plasma gasification where we vaporize trash in the presence of oxygen, uh, which produces these gases that we can trap and, and lock into rock. 
um, which again has some some drawbacks, but whatever. Uh, and then the last result is burial and long-term storage and secure vaults. Uh, deep well disposal is basically uh, pump liquid waste under high pressure. It, it's essentially fracking, but you don't want uh, you don't want anything to come back up. We're going to push these liquid wastes deep into, uh, like it says here, porous rock formations. Think of it as like a really, really deep underground cave that's far below aquifers. Um, idea is it's below the aquifer, so we don't have to uh, worry about water contamination, drinking water contamination, as much. We're still going to have, there, there's still going to be some. Um, so it's cheap. And we can retrieve the wastes for the most part if the problem is developed through fracking. Um, but, again, that's kind of a last resort type of thing. Uh, more ways that we could store hazardous waste. Surface impoundments we saw uh, with burning the future. Um, we saw that uh, those have issues. Uh, we ha There are secure hazardous waste landfills that are just meant for uh, really dangerous and hazardous things, but they're expensive. And takes a lot of uh, a lot of uh, uh, funding for manpower um, so employment costs are high the last section in the chapter is about how can we transition to a low waste economy um, it, it it's gonna rely on businesses um, but individuals within those businesses to be uh, kind of operate locally and then hope that that carries over globally um, there are many corporations and, and school systems and things like that that are committing to zero waste. So uh, getting rid of plastics and recycling and composting and things like that. Um, there's this NIMBY um, approach that says not in my backyard, so I don't, want, um, I don't want a landfill in my backyard. Well, the other side of that is NIABI or NOPE. So... Don't just advocate for yourself, advocate for everyone. If it's not right to have a landfill near your house, why is it okay to have it near a poor person's house or someone poorer than you? Um, there, there is this treaty that uh, was agreed to in 1992. We adopted it. We have not ratified it uh, here in the U.S. Uh, bans participating countries from shipping hazardous waste to or through countries without their permission. So that's, that, that's a really big deal. Um, the country has to agree to accept or to transmit hazardous waste through their borders. Um, and then there's the Stockholm Convention on POPs, Pacific Persistent Organic Pollutants, regulates the 12, uh, what they call the dirty dozen, that are the worst pollutants. They're strengthened in 2014 to ban or phase out all 12 of those. Um, and it's um, currently being, uh, they're looking at expanding to other uh, pollutants, uh, but you can imagine where the U.S. government falls on that. Uh, I talked about that already. Uh, 2000, Swedish Parliament passed a law uh, saying you have to do chemical risk assessments. We talked about that in uh, uh, in our risk unit. Uh, we talked about the fact that the burden of proof should be in the industry, should be on the industry, and not uh, just sort of assuming that everything is safe until proven otherwise. Uh, there are some things that hinder reuse and recycling. Most products don't include the high, those implicit costs that we've talked about all year. Um, reducing recycling industries don't receive the tax breaks given to the extraction industries. We talked a lot about that in our mining unit. I'm trying to make connections back as we approach the end of the year. Um, and then the demand and pricing for recycled materials fluctuates, so it's difficult to say, yes, this is going to be profitable uh, or this is going to cost me money. Last but not least, biomimicry is uh, the idea that we can use nature to solve these problems. Um, in, often in nature, one organism's waste becomes nutrients for another. Uh, you see there are resource webs. Uh, we can do the same thing in farming with creating soil communities and things along those lines. So uh, make sure you read about that in your text. I'm running short on time, so I'm not going to be able to talk about it in detail. Um, but it definitely has some some promise and and some um, some possibilities to su support and treat some of these issues that we've talked about. So that's chapter seventeen.